Hey everyone, you are watching Conversations in Pop Culture, and I am your host, Andrew Davis. And before we really get into this interview, and I am super stoked, I do want to remind everyone you need to support and financially support what you love, whether it is this show, my guest, anime, corporate media, whatever floats your boat. You need to support it and you need to economically support it because without money, the things you love do not get made. But enough about that. I don't want to make this a pity party here because I have with I do. amazing, amazing voice actor John Swayze, who may or may not want to make this a pity party, which is totally up to him. But welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Glad to be here. Yeah, no, I am super, super excited because you are in one of my favorite movies, Dazed and Confused. I'm a huge One Piece fan. I love My Hero Academia. I love Full Metal Alchemist, Neon Genesis Evangelion. And yeah, you pretty much run the gauntlet. But I do want to talk about Dazed and Confused first because you had a very pivotal role as the beer delivery guy. Short role, but I figured that's the only live action role we're going to be talking about with you because why wouldn't I take this amazing opportunity to talk to that guy who's that scene and oh, it's just an epic position. So, what's the story behind Dazed and Confused? So, um, I, uh, I, you know, I live in Houston, Texas, and I've uh lived here my whole life, and I uh became an actor and, and decided I was going to live here. I lived for a little while in LA and, and didn't have any success. And I, uh, matter of fact, the only acting job I got while I was in LA was back in Texas. So I had to come home for that. Um, but, uh, I, I really, uh, just, you know, wanted to work and make a living and, you know, Texas is a lot easier to make a living than California economically speaking anyway. <laughs> And uh, so I came back to Texas and uh, auditioned for this movie called Dazing and Fused. And um, it was a it was a wild experience. It was one of the coolest auditions I've ever done. Uh, I didn't realize that the guy running the camera was actually Richard Linklater, the director, because he was this, you know, young. I mean, I say young back then we were all young, but it, a little older than I am, but he was in a you know t-shirt and blue jeans had long hair and you know looked kind of like a pa not the director and uh there was this other guy don phillips who was older had white hair and a sport coat and blue jeans and cowboy boots and a nice press shirt and i was like well this is a guy in charge and it was like he could not have been further from the from the you know right on that but anyway it was a great audition had a lot of fun and um ended up getting cast as uh, the beer delivery guy. Um, and I think part of it was uh, I was a little older than the uh, most of the other people. So, you know, I, maybe me pulling a high schooler student would, would have been kind of uh, a little tricky. But anyway, I got cast as a beer delivery guy. And I like to call it the small but pivotal role in the movie because it changes the trajectory of the the storyline, you know, after the, it spoils the party at Pickford's house. So they have to figure out another game plan, but, um, had a great time shot, uh, in a day, uh, you know, went up like a Tuesday night shot on a Wednesday day and actually drove home. I probably stayed up there Wednesday night, you know, and partied and stuff and then came home Thursday and just, you know, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, then I became part of this iconic film that, uh, then of course, what was really cool about it is later on I started auditioning. I was auditioning for other movies and they'd see on my resume that I was in dazed and confused. And, you know, a couple of times they're like, I'd, I would audition. And they're like, Oh hell you got the part, dude. You're in dazed and confused. I was like, all right, well, that's just, this is, I like where this is going. So um, anyway, it was a really fun experience. Uh, Richard Linklater was a great director to work with. And uh, you know, I'd love to work with him again one day if he'd ever have me, but um, it was it was just a blast. A lot of fun. And, and even to talk further into this, because so it's weird where some movies become what I view as cult classics. And I really view that Dazed and Confused is a cult classic. It's also constantly, I feel like, finding a new audience as well. And you have Matthew McConaughey, Ben Affleck, Mila Jolovich was in it, Anthony Rapp was in it, and all these people. And then there's so many other people who have gone on 
into so many other things as well that that's why it keeps on finding a new audience. And so what is that like? Because your role is iconic and I'm 29. So obviously I found it in a Walmart bin in Blu-ray for 10 bucks and I fell in love with it. And then my friends fell in love with it. And I can't wait to have kids introduce it to them too. Mm -hmm. Because it's one of those movies that I feel like every generation can relate to in one way or another. Sure. What is that like for you? Because it's almost like it's not dying, the movie. And a lot of movies do die, if that makes any sense. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's one of those films that, uh, you know, it's, it has got that timeless, you know. Um, one of my favorite lines is, you know, they talk about the 70s. It's like, man, the 70s suck the worst time period ever and i'm like oh my god you know it's so funny because i grew up you know i was that age in the 80s you know i graduated high school in 83 so i was you know in the age of punk rock and um, uh, hair bands and all this stuff and i'm like no that era sucks the 70s was great you know grateful dead almond brothers you know all that kind of great music led zeppelin um so but as, as far as the film goes, you know, it, it's really just, I mean, you know, you just never know if you're going to be part of something iconic like that. You know, I mean, uh, we were talking earlier about fast times at Ridgemont high and that was, you know, uh, set a little later. Um, but that was the movie. Like when I was in high school, man, I just, I wanted to be Jess Spicoli. I was like, <laughs> we, we used to, I used to mimic him you know, all the time, like, dude, we used to quote that movie left and right, you know, it was, and uh, it was, it was a hoot and, uh, and small little uh, funny little tidbit, but um, just kind of how the, the world goes round uh, department. But I was in Days and Confused, this one iconic movie about high school uh, in the eighties. In uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, there's a guy, an actor named Sonny Carl Davis, who's a Texas actor and a wonderful, wonderful actor. And um, he plays the guy in, in Fast Times that is when he, he brings his breakfast back to Brad at the counter in the restaurant to return it because he's not 100 percent satisfied. And Brad says, well, you've eaten like three quarters of it. And he goes, well, I don't care. I'm, I want it. And he goes, you know, and they get into a big argument and the manager he ends up cussing at the customer and the manager takes over and whatnot. But anyway, that actor is played by Sonny Carl Davis. Well, um, before I actually did Fast Times at Ridgemont High, I worked on a movie in 89 called Pair of Aces, which is with Willie Nelson and Chris Christopherson. And it was a made-for-TV movie on CBS. And Sonny played my brother in that movie. We played murderous brothers and uh, and Sonny was actually very, like, almost like a mentor to me because he had he's older than I am. And he had been in the movie business a lot longer than me. And he was kind of showing me the ropes and stuff. And, and uh, we've remained friends, you know, since. And uh, but then he later went on to work on, a, you know, Days to Confuse was work uh, directed by Richard Linklater. And Sonny went on to work uh, with Richard Linklater on a movie called Bernie. So it's just kind of an interesting crossing paths and and you know uh just the way things worked out and all that kind of stuff but anyway yeah it was it was a wonderful experience uh i didn't fare as well as matthew mcconaughey uh you know the story that i've heard i don't know if it's true or not but his character wooderson was only supposed to be on the mo on the set for like a scene <laughs> or a day or two you know and apparently he took off his shirt and was walking around the set and everyone was like, oh, my God. And he was so awesome that they were like, well, let's put him in another scene, you know, and another scene and another scene. And pretty soon, man, he's got the whole whole movie worked out. So, I mean, good for him. I couldn't be happier. My, I think one of my bucket list things now is to actually meet McConaughey and, you know, have a drink with him and swap stories although mine's mine will be way shorter than his but uh nonetheless i'd love to meet him someday well, well I, I wouldn't i wouldn't count yourself out because you know the reason how i know you is partially dazed and confused but mostly from anime 
And so obviously I think a lot of people know you from anime, right. voice acting and voice directing, and you've had some pretty significant roles and I mentioned it already, but how did you even get into that? Because Texas, I think the three capitals are New York, Texas, and LA for voice acting. And obviously Texas is, I think the biggest right now for anime. Oh, without a doubt, without a I mean, doubt. I mean, Funimation and the fusion of Crunchyroll with Sony, it's no competition, at least, at least in dubbing, I think. No, 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 no. You're Andrew, you're absolutely right. So back in 1997, I think, uh, I was living, I'm living in Houston, making a living as an actor, mainly doing, I was doing a little bit of film work, commercial work, stuff like that, but I was mainly doing, uh, uh, voiceover for like commercials and, and, uh, industrial training videos and stuff like that you know it was nothing sexy hang on let me shift positions here oh, there we go um let's see if i can't I've, I've got my phone on a stand i'm gonna try to see if i can't make it work here but anyway um try not to get anybody sick hang on hang in everybody okay i'm right here Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hang on. It's all going to be worth it, folks. I promise. There we go. All right. Now we got our jersey on. There we go. Uh, anyway, so um, I was uh, working and I was in a comedy band called the PC Cowboys. It was a politically correct country and Western band. And um, it was a fun thing to do and whatnot. We were doing a show and I met this guy who was also another voice actor. And, uh, we got to talking and, and I was kind of like, you know, dude, I'm surprised we've never crossed paths before because Houston is a big town, but it's a small entertainment market. And as far as the talent goes, you know, and uh, he goes, well, I do anime. And I was like, what's anime? And he goes, it's Japanese animation. Now, this is 1997, right? R and he right goes, well, when it was coming to the U.S. Right. Yeah. And he goes, well, there's a studio here in Texas that does it and right here in Houston called ADV films. And I was like, okay. So I went and had an audition. Uh, I sucked at the audition, but I, I got a second audition actually and, and did much better and started doing anime. But for the first year, I didn't even know what I was doing. I was like, you know, I don't know what this is. I, why does everybody have blue spiky hair? And what's, you know, what is all this stuff? And uh, I've been there doing it now for 27 years. And I, uh, Funimation came along and I started working for them. And, uh, you know, just fast forward to today, um, I direct full time at ADV became Sentai Filmworks in Houston. And uh, uh, Funimation was merged with Crunchyroll and then Sony bought them both and merged them into Crunchyroll. And Sentai Filmworks was bought out by AMC Networks. And so, uh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, Houston or Texas, you've got Rooster Teeth in Austin, you've got Gearbox in, in Dallas and a couple of little satellite anime studios that do pickup work for other studios. I mean, it's just, there's no question that Texas is the undisputed heavyweight champion when it comes to dubbing and subtitling anime in North America. And, uh, you know, it's just weird because when you think of Texas, you think like oil, <laughs> And now it's like oil, anime. You know, it's like these two, where did my hands go? They're there. It's these two different things. And uh, so I'm just, I've been able to make a, you know, I make a living, knock on wood. I work here full time and go to conventions and, you know, do the, do the whole thing. But it's, 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 it's an everyday thing, you know, so I'm, I feel very blessed. Yeah. And I want to talk about some of your roles because, I know a bunch of your roles, and one of your roles is very special to my heart, and that's Neon Genesis Evangelion. And in, I think, a few weeks, that's actually coming to theaters, the fourth movie. And I know, I think it was done last year, but I think it's now coming, you know, the English version into theaters in December. And so I'm super stoked for that. But I know you worked on the director's cut of that first, I believe. And... You were, you know, pretty much Shinji's dad. And then a great number one dad, guys. Number one dad is all I'm going to say. 
on, on him. Um, and so what was that like? Because you weren't, I think, the first, you know, Gendo, I think is how mm-hmm. his name is pronounced. No. But no, it wasn't. The, the, the very first guy. Gendo was an actor by the name of Tristan McCabry, who worked at ADV Films. And for whatever reason, he decided he flipped out or I don't know what happened. I don't know the details, but he was no longer doing it. So Matt Greenfield, who was one of the founders of ADV Films and the dubbing director for Evangelion, asked me if I would, you know, he said, can you, I I really kind of developed a a reputation for being a, a character actor and could do a lot of different voices and stuff like that. And they said, do you think you could do we don't want you to, to mimic what Tristan did, but we do want you to capture what he did, you know, the essence. Which really, when you're dubbing anyway, that's all you're doing with the Japanese actor. You're not trying to mimic what they did. You're just trying to capture the essence of what they are embodying. And so I did. I got it. And I started doing the episodes. I did the movies. Then uh, ADV uh, had a flip-flop, upside-down, turmoil thing, and that property and a bunch of other ones went up to Funimation, and they took it over, but they kept the cast intact. So um, I went up and I did the movies up there, and then everything was fine, and then um, Netflix decided to do a version, and they recast everybody. And Ray Chase... Uh, who's a very good actor and very talented guy. And he's a, I mean, I know him. He's a friend of mine. Uh, He took over the role of Gendo for the Netflix version. To my knowledge, I have not seen it, but to my understanding, it was not very well received. A lot of the hardcore Ava fans were very upset about it. Yeah, it it was, it was very much as a fan. This is just my opinion. I don't think the voice acting was bad. I just think we as fans felt betrayed, if Mm -hmm. that makes any sense. And I think that, you know, there's a concept where you don't mess with certain things, I feel like, in anime. And Neon Genesis, in my opinion, was one of those things where it should have just been left alone. And it was whether, you know, for whatever reason or as much left alone as humanly possible. And I think that that's how it played out, because we as Neon Genesis Evangelion fans, that's our baby. And we don't really appreciate it. I'm just saying from my opinion and how I see it. No, I get it. I get it. And I think you're not alone, Andrew. You're certainly not alone. So then um, Amazon got a hold of the movies and we redid the movies. They brought back the entire cast, original cast. We redid the movies and they did a fourth movie. So and that's the one that you say is going to be back in theaters. I, I don't I didn't, I didn't even know I don't think it was ever in theaters where I live. Well, not back in theaters, but they're going to release it into theaters. Yeah, me and my friends are going. We got our tickets. It's exciting. Are they I'm doing? Is smoke. it the su- but are they doing the subtitled version or the dubbed version? I don't know. I don't know on that. I know there's like three or four screenings of it, and I think we're going on December third. Me and my friends, and we're excited for it, and we're going to be watching the first three movies together before we go and we're gonna have a blast because well you know what's really cool dude is i mean you know uh one piece red is coming out and um i saw that too that was great you know dragon ball had some movies and you know it's what's really cool is you know they're doing these premieres and stuff like that but i mean it's like you know these anime movies are bringing in millions at the box office and um so it's it's pretty cool what they're doing as far as um, you know having these screenings and stuff like that. I mean, I'm I'm thrilled because as you know, dude. Like when I like I said when I started doing this in '97, the audience to put it in perspective, the audience was as big as my finger. Now, the audience is as big as this, this. This, I mean, it's just, it is huge. And it's still, the mushroom cloud is still growing. It's it, not. It was one of the things that the way I describe it is that I never got shoved into a locker in high school for like anatomy, but I wasn't the popular kid. It wasn't cool. It wasn't exciting. People who were in anatomy shirt, they would look at you a little weird, but I didn't really care. I mean, my friends didn't care. Nobody like messed with us, but 
that we were on the off skirts doing our own thing. But now everybody's watching anime. Everybody knows this stuff. And then mm-hmm. even it coming into theaters, what is that like? Because I know that the dubbing, as far as being in the studio alone, and I think even the craft really hasn't changed. But the fact that it's so much bigger where now it's in theaters and it's in phantom events and it's right next to all the top movies in a movie theater. And it's also an event because it's only in theaters for three days. And so if you're going to want to see it, you have to make it a priority. Right. And I don't know if that makes any sense, it's almost like Sunday football where Sunday football is a priority where it's only on Sunday. And so like, that's right. how I do. so I'm very curious how you feel because it's now to me, it seems it's a bigger deal this if that may like i don't know if i'm making any sense i don't know if i'm crazy no 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 i mean you might be crazy i don't know but i mean (laughs) i'm just saying that that's you're absolutely spot on right i mean that's you know and and you will yeah it's only up for three days but i mean and i'm going to pick a number what if you get a million people over all the theaters to go see it in three days i mean i don't know how many theaters it's going to be at but it's just you know what if you what if you know it, I, I do think that in a lot of ways, I mean, anime is sort of still having to prove itself because I can tell you right now in the voiceover world as a voice actor, um, if you're an anime dub voice actor, uh, you're sort of at the bottom of the, the food chain when it comes to voice acting. Uh, you're not it's not revered. It's not like, oh, my God. Well, it wasn't. It is now. It, it's a lot more now. But it used to be very much like, oh, you dub anime. That's good for you. God, yeah. Maybe it's one day you'll, like be a, how comics you'll grow up to be a real right. voice actor. What did what, what, you say? Well, I said, you know, people would be like, well, maybe one day you'll grow up to be a real voice actor. You know, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, okay, whatever it is. But it's funny because when you go to these conventions now, uh, you know, especially the, you know, the, I mean, an anime convention is one thing. But when you start going to these pop cons like Rhode Island Comic Con or, you know, even San Diego or New York Comic Con or whatever. I mean, when, uh, you know, New York Comic Con was uh, a few weeks ago and uh, I mean, they were pimping the you know what out of red. I mean, they had it up on Times Square. I was just in New York doing a signing and in time where I was at a restaurant and I looked out the window and there's a giant projection of my hero academia on the wall in Times Square. I mean, you know, it's not, you know, what are they, this ain't your daddy's anime anymore. I mean, this is like, it is, it is reaching out exponentially across the board to people. So yeah, to see it in theaters like that is phenomenal. Oh no, I don't know where he went. Sorry, my daughter was calling me. Oh, I was just on pitch black on my go snap. Like, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And, and I think it's only getting bigger. I mean, I just saw One Piece Red. I saw Dragon Ball Superhero. And I thought that was great. And the theater was packed. When I went to go see Red, the theater wasn't packed. But there was like a good like 40, 50 people in there. But I also saw it on a Thursday. But I know that my friend saw it on Friday. And he said the theater was packed. And I think, you know, this movie is going to have a bunch of people across America seeing it, too. And so it's kind of crazy to me where anime has gone. And then even going further into a role that is another favorite of mine, and that's Elfin Line. And uh, I know it's a slightly smaller role, but uh, Lucy has a lot of explaining to do is how I view Elfin Line. And you're a professor, uh, <laughs> By the way, I think it's Elfin Lead. Lean. Self and lean, maybe. I don't know. It's been a while since I've seen it, but 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 I do remember that it's a very bloody anime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My uh, friend of mine, Jin Ho Chung, uh, directed that, and uh, uh, yeah, he he'll get a kick out of it because it I, it's get a lot of love right now. A lot of people are talking about it. I don't know why all of a sudden, but it's getting it's just getting a lot of love. You're like the I mean, every week somebody mentions it to me. <laughs> so, you know. It's, it's just it, a great it, show. It really is. It's not that complicated. 
There's a lot of stuff going on in it, and it's easy to watch. I yeah. mean, to a degree, and I don't have to like know 50 things about it, where it's very linear in a lot of ways, and it's very, very helpful. And it's just like I could turn that show on at any point and know what's going on. Right, 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 right. Well, that's cool, man. I'm gonna have to share that with him to Wednesday when I see him. And then, and then, and then a much tamer role that you were in. And I just want to mention it briefly because I also like this one, just because when you're half drunk, you know, this show is a great show, and that's Shin Chan. Ah! Shin Chan <laughs> is so wholesome and so ridiculous. And the character you play is Yoshi Koyama, I want to say. I think is how his right, name is. Right. That sounds about right. And and so he's, you know, Shin Chan's grandfather and he's very sort of strict but he's also very childish he's very conservative in how he conducts himself he conducts himself sort of in a highway but you know also can be you know arguing about sort of stupid things and uh it's a very fascinating show to say the least i'm back so 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 i mean i i i just love this show because i just think this show is absolutely just wholesome as i was stating and it's a fun character because you get that, you know, I guess high society character, but then you also get the child in him. And then <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> ah, there you go. There we are. Yeah, so, 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 I mean, what is this like? Because he's like four characters in one in so many ways where he's that high society, the child, the goofy grandfather, and the loving grandfather. And he's like a combination of like literally like 15 roles you've had. And it's great. And, and again, the show is just so wholesome. And it's so much fun to watch this show. Uh, Shin Chan was a hilarious show to work on because – uh, I remember Zach Bolton was the director and they pretty much told him that, dude, you can do anything you want with this show. <laughs> and so we did <laughs> kind of like not, not quite to the extent, but kind of like ghost stories. Yeah. So what, what, what is that like to have a lot of freedom with a show? Because obviously when you do anime, you know, the show is already animated Mm -hmm. And if you're dubbing it, you know, you're, you know, pretty much stuck with the direction it's going in. But even when you have a show like Chin Chan, there's a lot of, I think, freedom. There's also a lot of humor. Also, the show doesn't take itself as serious as the show we're going to talk about in one second. One Piece does. But what is that like? Because Chin Chan is just goofy, if that makes any sense. And it's, yeah, it's I mean, you know, uh, the first thing is anything you're dubbing. The first roadblock, if you will, that you have is you're locked into the lip flaps. I mean, you have to fit the lip flaps. Um, so no matter what you say, no matter what you change, no matter how you want to doctor the script, it doesn't matter. You, you still have to fit within the lip flaps, right? Um, but, you know, when you, when you have an opportunity to change up a script and say something really funny and ad lib and do that, you know, it's, I mean, it, it's a little, little taste of the freedom, you know, that you don't normally get. So it's always a lot of fun to be able to kind of run with that and, and take it as far as you can. Um, you know, and then it just, one of the things that we did, uh, I will tell your viewers, if y'all get a chance, check out Lake Texarkana Gamera. And it's a uh, it's a live action kaiju movie that we did uh, as the brainchild of of my good friend, uh, one of my best friends, Kyle Jones, who's also a director at, at Sentai. Um, he directed Food Wars and uh, Is It Wrong to Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon? And um, was, was Kyle behind Haiku as well? Hi Haiku, yeah, you bet, you bet. And, uh, I love I love that show. That show right. is so good. And that and Kyle, so anyway, Kyle's a very twisted human being, but a wonderful, wonderful person. But anyway, 
uh, he, it was his idea. But what we did was this was a live action monster movie about Gamera, who's a turtle like Godzilla, but he's a giant turtle. And we we dubbed the whole movie as a bunch of Texas rednecks. And, uh, <laughs> we were able to we were able to uh, really, you know, have fun with it. But again, we had to try to stick to the lip flaps, but we man, we changed it. If you send me your uh, well, I'll send you a link. I'll send you a we transfer and you can download it and watch it with your friends. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. We we did like one of the things we did is we left the main character, the girl. We left the regular, we did it, we did the movie the way it was supposed to be done originally. I mean, we dubbed it straight, you know, just this is the trick, this is the dub, you know, for the movie. And then we did this comedic version, but um, it really turned out well. So uh, it's a lot of fun. And we show it at conventions and stuff like that. But anyway, it, it, to answer your question, it's, it's, you're, when you're, you're locked in to, uh, doing stuff that was within the scope of the voice of the, of the lip flaps. So um, any chance you get to vary from that in any way is always appreciated and welcome. Yeah, no. And I, I think this is something that people don't understand about voice acting is that especially if, you know, most anime that's brought over is not built where a lot of the time with something like F is for family they do the voices first and then they build the anime around it. Right. So, so, uh, yeah, d I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Andrew, but basically oh, feel free what, to. Feel free Western, to me Western animation is you write it, you record it, you create the soundtrack and then you animate around that. We're doing it the other way around where we've got it. We've got it animated. We've got, Japanese recording, we've got uh, sound and effects and all that. We are dubbing in the English version. So we're removing the Japanese and inserting the English. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a different way to do it, you know, for sure. And, and also, we're not just inserting, pardon me, we're not just inserting the English. We're inserting the English in a script that's already been written. You know, we can't really deviate from that. You know, like if, if you're working on a script for that's prelay, like F is for family, which is one of my favorite shows, by the way. Um, you know, you can, you can come up with a line that's scripted and go, Hey, wait, 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 let me, let me, let me try something different. You know, let me play around with that a little bit. And it may, you know, they end up, you end up having a whole sequence of lines that isn't even really wasn't scripted. It was just ad lib, you know, but it was so funny they left it. But you can't really do that in anime because you're changing. You can you you can't change the script so much that it changes plot line or plot development or or character development or anything like that. You have to leave it, you know, as is. This is one of the things that's very interesting, and it kind of brings us to One Piece, where obviously One Piece had a four kids version, and there were certain things that were done in four kids. And then just to be polite about this, Funimation Crunchyroll then took it over Four Kids, lost it. And let's call it what it is. Four Kids censored a bunch of stuff in One Piece. And then Funimation Crunchyroll took it over. They redubbed it. Certain episodes were, I guess, brought back. Certain things were, I felt, more traditional on how it aired in Japan. And... You know, that's why we have some crazy scenes in, you know, the Funimation that are not in the four kids. And so you obviously played a very important character in One Piece, and that is Sir Crocodile, the, the, the fantastic Sir Crocodile, might I add. Um, Thank you. And uh, he, he's great. He's great, obviously. I like him after the Alabasta arc a lot more than I like him during the Alabasta arc, but... What was this like coming into One Piece? Because everybody in Funimation has played a character in One Piece at this yeah. point. Everybody's done it. Everybody in Dallas has played a character in One Piece. Well, that's because it's got a bazillion characters in it and, you know, bazillion episodes. I think even my daughter's been in One Piece now. Uh, Olivia, she started voice acting a few years ago. And I think 
she's gotten a couple of jobs with Funimation. And I think she's actually done some stuff for One Piece. But um, uh, my entree into One Piece was actually not even Crocodile. It was uh, another character that I played, uh, Gonfall. And um, uh, he's an old, kind of an old knight. And he, he rides a big bird. And, uh, but when I auditioned, I, I don't know if I auditioned for it or not, but anyway, when I got the role of, of Crocodile, uh, I was working on it and it was a lot of fun. And I was like, oh my God, this guy's great. I love the fact that he's, you know, he's big like this and he gets to really force himself. And, and it was uh, a lot of fun for me. Um, I always have always enjoyed working uh, as Crocodile. Um, See, let, let's even talk about him because he is a devious human being in the Alabaster arc. And obviously he's running Baroque Works. He's a warlord. He's got his entire crew. You know, he's Mr. Zero and he's got his entire crew. And then basically he's causing chaos in Alabaster. And he's mean and it's fantastic. And he's just so criminal. And what is that like? Because it really sets up the Straw Hats and Luffy of being a real contender in, you know, the new world, I feel. And it's a pivotal moment. In the <coughs> that entire yeah. arc is one of the most important arcs in One Piece, I feel. You know, right next to Impel Down for the first half of One Piece because it really is the noticing of the Straw Hats, what they stand for, and the fact that, you know, Zoro and Arizolo and Luffy now are real threats and are getting noticed taking down a warlord and exposing a massive, you know, criminal operation. Yeah. You know, um, it, and and I'm not saying you knew that was what was going to happen. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, we don't, you know, we don't know anything that's going to happen until we walk in the studio and we record it. But, uh, you know, for me, um, you know, I play a lot of bad guys and a lot of dads and sometimes they're the same guy. So, um, I E, Gendo from Evangelion, uh, Hohenheim from Full Metal. Um, but uh, they, I mean, the, villains are the most important character in any show, in my opinion, because without a villain, there's nothing for the hero to do. So it's, it's, it, there, it's very, it can be, it's, it's going to be boring. It's going to be stupid. But, um, uh, I, I just love playing characters like that. I love uh, the fact that they're like, not just iconic, but they're just so, they're just so much fun, you know? Yeah, let's even go further into Crocodile because Luffy kicks his ass. I mean, it's just a call politely. And then what happens is that he gets sent to Impel Down. And then who saves Crocodile? Pretty much Luffy and Buggy the Clown save Crocodile, bust him out of Impel Down, and then now they're in the middle of the Whitebeard War. And Crocodile's kind of a good guy in this argument, in this segment. Right, right. He he saves Luffy instead of killing Whitebeard, taking a shot at Whitebeard. He clashes with Doflamingo. And we have all these amazing moments with Crocodile. And so what was that like? Because here you have a character that is hated and then i'm watching i'm like man we just busted out crocodile and now he's fighting against the marines and helping luffy try to save ace and really saving luffy and now maybe even though luffy kind of put him in prison they're not at war with each other and it really opens up a whole new side of crocodile i feel well, and it opens up like the possibilities of where it could go in the future and what's going to happen, because obviously only the creator of the show knows that. And I don't know that, but uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot of the speculation of is Crocodile Luffy's mom, um, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. But it's, you know, it's, it's exciting to see, you know, where these turns take you, you know, where they go and that kind of thing. But um, it's just, it's just a fun thing. You know, a lot of times too, Andrew, you know, when we record the way that we record, we don't record in a linear fashion, meaning that uh, they don't bring in 
each actor in order of appearance or anything like that. So you may come in and do your stuff and you don't even see what's happened before or after you just kind of do your stuff. So you're not even sure what is going on until it, the finished product comes out, you know? Yeah. yeah. And even to further go into this, I mean, obviously crocodile just in the manga, not to ruin anything, but him and Mihawk are now formed the cross guild. And they have an organization that's basically putting bounties on Marines with Buggy the Clown as the head of it. And so clearly Crocodile is with Mr. One and they're a big threat now too. And they're almost a third force. Now, are, are you, are you talking about in the anime or in the manga? In the manga, this is what's just dropped. And so it's so interesting right. because, 30, 40 chapters ago but like it's one of those things that it's almost like the gift that keeps on giving where now that he's out in the i guess the world and free you know anything could happen with crocodile and he was obviously i think in stampede as well and then my understanding is that we're getting one piece odyssey that actually is the video game that's dealing with alabasta too and so this is why this is so interesting so topical for me is Crocodile is front and center right now in a lot of ways. Come January, I mean, Crocodile is going to be, I think, the most talked about One Piece character beyond the Straw Hats because there's just so much stuff coming out now. Right. So what well, is that it's, like for you? It, it's interesting. It's weird, right? It, it, yeah, and that's interesting because uh, the same kind of thing is happening with uh, another lovable evil villain uh, in My Hero. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, there's pop funkos of these characters, so clearly something's happening. Right, right. But I mean, they're you know, uh, they're in the manga. I, I was just recording some uh, some stuff the other day about with uh, one with my hero, and and um, you know, the manga is probably a season ahead of where the anime is. Um. So yeah, I'm I, what I'm really looking forward to what's going to be coming down the pike for uh, both Crocodile and and, uh, and uh, All for One. And, well, 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 we're just going to say this. Crocodile is probably a lot more love than All for One. Oh, because- oh, God, <laughs> yes. Yes, nobody loves All for One. Are you kidding me? Only I, mean, only, I, mean, I love All for One, and that's it. He, he's a perfect villain, though. He really is. He is a perfect villain. And so what is that like for you as well? Because that's a big role. And what I like about All for One is that All for One is sort of the main villain. And obviously there's, you know, where we're inching towards. And I'm actually probably about 12 episodes behind everybody else in My Hero. So, and I'm purposely not reading the manga, you know, because I want to be shocked by the anime. Mm -hmm. Um, But what is that like? Because All for One doesn't all have that much time, I guess, screen time. But it makes every single speech of his so much more significant, I feel. And I feel like him being off screen and when you voice him and he's on screen, it's so much bigger. And, and it has so much more of an impact, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. I know I'm saying that a lot, but like it's weird to say it that way. But like I feel like he's like a real villain and he's a real threat. First thing with Crocodile, I, Crocodile can hurt you and do damage to you, but... I don't get that same immediate threat. Well, I think one of the differences is, is crocodile is, is like in the, in the old Batman series, I don't know if you ever watched that, but in the old Batman series with Adam West, there was, uh, um, you know, six villains. There was the Joker, the penguin, the Riddler, Catwoman, and then Mr. Freeze and, you know, some others. I mean, there was this thing. Um, but, and that's like, to me, that's like Crocodile. He's one of the, he's a big villain, but he's not the only thing that Luffy's going up against. Um, in my hero, even though there's Shigaraki and there's, you know, uh, various other villains, there's a whole league of villains, but at the top of it all is all for one. 
And I, I think of it like this. And, and Eric Vale, who plays uh, Shigaraki, um, he and I were talking about this one day. And I, I said, you know, to me, and I was actually talking about this with Colleen uh, Clinkenbeard, who's the director, ADR director. They said, I don't know if anyone's ever made this analogy or that noticed this, and maybe I'm the last one to the party if they have. But there seems to be a real strong similarity between All for One and Shigaraki in My Hero and the Emperor and Darth Vader in Star Wars. And, and I feel like I'm the Emperor and I'm using Shigaraki and others and whatever to do, not necessarily do my bidding. I mean, I, you know, I had a huge fight with All Might, right? But it's like All for One has this, no matter what happens, it's like All for One seems to act like that was exactly what I anticipated would happen. <laughs> you know, it's that's going according to my plan no matter what it is. And I think it's like, he's got a contingency for a contingency for a contingency. So no matter what happens, he'll always go. Excellent. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I was planning on, you know, and it's like, really? But uh, yeah. And they're, I mean, they're so different in their villainy, um, but they're so much, both so much fun to play. So to yeah. even talk about that, even to go further and even take a step outside of voice acting a little bit on that. I mean, obviously, my hero, One Piece, you know, Neon Genesis Evangelion, and there's a few other, I mean, others, those are really big shows. And so what is that like for you? Because at this point now, every anime fan knows My Hero Academia. And mm -hmm. there are what I call true believer fans. And same thing with One Piece. And so what is that like for you? Because it doesn't really matter if somebody's a villain or not because they're just excited to see a voice actor at a con and they're like, oh man, you're the villain right next to, you know, Deku. And they're very excited. And so what is that like? Because that's kind of, you know, it's, I think One Piece, My Hero, Attack on Titan, you know, and there's a few others are the top shows and you've been involved in some of them. So what is that like? Because let's be realistic, 10 years ago, anime and being in a top show would not have this reaction i feel and maybe absolutely I'm... you you are exactly spot on andrew and you know that's what i was talking about earlier that you know the way it's exploded and it's continuing to grow is you know the popularity quotient is off the chart and uh like i said you know i play a lot of villains so um i think that while i've i've been very blessed and very fortunate that People love the work I've done, and I'm very grateful for that. And and uh, people, you know, know all the characters I've done, and and you know, and I've been very fortunate. There's a lot of them, you know, but uh, you know, people also still love the hero, and so. Um, but I think what's about to happen, at least with Crocodile, and it happened with Gendo. But it's, it's going to happen with Crocodile and with uh, All for One is they're going to get a turn to have one, you know, one final big showdown. And who knows who will win? You know, I don't know. I mean, we don't. It's not always the good guy wins anymore. You know, that's that's not always what makes for good entertainment. Sometimes the bad guy wins. And also, what what is a hero without a great villain, right? Exactly. You're exactly I mean, right. Let, let's exactly be realistic right. here. When you watch a movie and you go see a Marvel movie, do you go see the Marvel movie or the DC movie for Batman, or do you or Superman? Or do you go see it because you want to see what Lex Luthor is going to do? Because I personally am rooting for Lex Luthor every single time because I want to see what he's going to do. Or you know, Dark Side, I want to see you, or Doomsday. I want to see what that person is going to do. And because I know Superman, but I don't know what they're going to do to make it different. So I'm not rooting for Superman to lose. I'm rooting to put Superman in a bad situation that forces evolution. And that's how I view it. Villains is that especially all for one is a good example. I want to see what he does to Deku and Totokuri 
and the entire class 1A group so that they have to either overcome it or sacrifices or something. And and I want to see some serious consequences, everybody. That's what I want to see. Yeah, but right, right. I Absolutely. digress. I digress. Absolutely. Uh, you can't just – you don't want it to be clean and, oh, that was fun. It just – no, you want it to have consequences and to have – real depth to it. Um, and, and like I said, I mean, sometimes the good guy just doesn't win, you know, and that's, or they don't totally win, you know, and and we, we, we could take a moment now for science for this. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he's, he's the real villain technically. I mean, he really sure. is the villain. <laughs> I love Oh, and I'm so much. I love it, man. It's just, it's just so sad. It's just so sad. But obviously, I mean, he he redeemed himself. But but that was that. That's a great role in brotherhood. It's a great role in brotherhood. Well, thank and, you, thank you. That was a, he was a lot of fun for sure, man. He was, uh, you know, that was another one that I auditioned for, and um, the original actor was uh, Scott McNeil, uh, Canadian voice actor. And a great guy, great actor. And uh, there was some snafu, I think, where he couldn't come down to the States and record. And I don't know. I don't know what happened. But anyway, they asked me again, kind of like with Gendo. Hey, could you do this? We don't want you to mimic him. But if you could just sort of capture his essence. And I did. And then I did Brotherhood. And, you know, I'm just fortunate that that's uh, become sort of the that's the 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 more popular of the two. Uh, uh, show or the two uh, installations of of uh, Full Metal. I have to say, Brotherhood is a nearly perfect anime. It is a nearly perfect anime where it is absolutely amazing to watch. And if anybody hasn't seen Brotherhood, that is the one anime that you should watch when you have time off. I think it's like 64 episodes and it is 64 episodes of just pure bliss. And, yeah. and that's all I'm going to say about Brotherhood because it is a nearly perfect anime. Everybody cast it as perfect in it. Every piece of it, every episode is nearly perfect. And I don't know if there's another anime pound for pound that is better than Brotherhood and what it has done. And, and, and that's partially because of you and everybody else involved in that. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much. And then there's one more rule that I want to talk about before we talk about the other side of what you do. And I'm a big Hasoda fan and the boy and the beast. Ah, yes. Because this is kind of in it. And I'm going to give a little pretense and feel free to correct me. Um, Hasoda and Shinkai are the next two major Japanese directors that are sort of replacing Miyazaki in a lot of ways. And so (coughs) it's very cool. And the boy and the beast was great. And so what is that like? Because it is a big deal when a movie like that comes over into the States. And I think you also were in a Shinkai film, too, back in the day. Uh, you'd have to tell me the name of it. To... The Place um, Promised in Our Early Days. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah. That's an old one. That's an old that one. That is an old one. It's directed by uh, Carl Masick, as a matter of fact, um, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway... Uh... Yeah, you know, Miyazaki is is the Spielberg and uh, Momura Hosada is like uh, the, I mean, pick a famous director, the, you know, uh, George Lucas. I don't know. <laughs> it just, it's just Christopher there. Nolan. He, I go with Christopher Nolan on that. Christopher one. Nolan, fair enough. He, fair enough. He's just, he's one of those guys that it's just like, man, dude, this is beautiful. Uh, the Boy and the Beast is actually one of my favorite all time roles to ever do. Um, I, I really, really relish doing that. Um, I had a blast. It was a fun movie. I think it's a beautifully done movie. It's got an amazing cast with uh, Lucy Christian, Eric Vale, um, Ian Sinclair. Uh, just a, it just it's phenomenal. And to be a part of it uh, in that capacity, uh, Mike McFarland was the director, and he just did a wonderful job. Uh, really letting us kind of do what we want to do and, um, uh, you know, guiding us along, but, but giving us a lot of freedom yeah, at the no, same time. I mean, I'll be very honest. When I looked at it, I wasn't exactly sold on it. 
And I said, this could go either way. And I was very happy when I left the theater in which I was very, very happy when I basically was like, oh man, I was good because, you know, I was like the boy and the beast. It seems a little interesting. I'm not too sure where we're going with this. And I was wrong. Is all I'm going to say. And I was very, very happy with the story. I was very happy with the voice acting. And I thought it was a great film. I yeah. really did. And I think that it was an excellent job. And, you know, I was pleasantly surprised, which is a good thing. But I'm very honest. And, I, and, and you know, I look into, you know, stuff. And it's a great film is all I'm going to say, too. It's, it's another well, one that you should watch. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny little story about The Boy and the Beast um, after we had recorded it. But um, one day, my son, who's 18 now, he'll be 19 and shortly, but he really loves anime. And one day I walked into his room, this is years ago, but I walked into his room and he was on his phone. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm watching some anime. I said, oh, cool. What are you watching? He goes, Soul Leader. I said, oh, very cool. You know, your old man plays Lord Death. And he goes, yeah, I'm watching the Japanese version. I'm like, what? He goes, sorry, dad. I'm just watching the subtitle. I was like, get out. I go, he goes, this is my room. And I'm like, no, get out of my house. <laughs> so conversely, uh, when, when The Boy and the Beast came out, it had a small run in movie theaters because they wanted to submit it for uh, Academy Award con you know, consideration. Not the dub version, but just the movie in general, the subtitle version. And, but anyway, we went to go see the movie in the dub version at the movie theater. Took my whole family. And there were about 20 or 30 people in the audience. You know, it was nice. And as we're walking out, we're in this crowd of people. And my 10-year-old daughter, <laughs> holding my hand, looks up to me and she goes, Daddy, you were awesome as the voice of the beast. And everyone in the crowd's like, what? That's you? You're Sean Swayze? Oh, my God. Oh, oh. And they all want to get autographs and pictures and all this. And I just looked over at my son and I was like. So let, let's talk about this because I'm not going to name who, but I had somebody on my show a little while ago. And uh, he, he has a traditional day job. And, and you might know who it is, but, but I don't want to out them because it's not my place to do it. But you know who you know who I'm talking about? By any chance? <laughs> no, I have no clue. Somebody uh, with a day job. That, but but, yeah. but they voice a very prominent character in an anime. Um, so what they were concerned about is that it hasn't become a problem yet. But if it does become a problem, they're going to ask to change locations at their job. So, like, what is that like for you, though? Because you're in a theater and obviously people might recognize you. You're going to go see it just like, I guess, every other fan. And then you're spotted and it could be sort of good and bad, right? Like, you know. Oh, no, no, there's no bad about it. There's no bad about it. If, if I mean, if somebody recognized me at a, you know, um, whatever, dude, that that's a that's a joy for me. That's that's an honor and a privilege. Um, I, I we were at a at Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, on a family vacation this past spring break and my daughter my other daughter unbeknownst to me walked up to this girl and said they were having dinner a few tables over from us and she goes she had on a demon slayer shirt she goes do you like anime and she went yeah and she goes do you like my hero academia and she went oh yeah and she goes see that guy over there that's the voice of all for one and she went no way so i had to come over i gave her an autograph i took a picture she was flipping out and her parents said this has been the best part of universal so now dude if that stuff happens i mean i'm 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 honored and touched and it it means the world to me so absolutely and then i love that now, now, I want to table your voice stuff there because I do want to talk briefly about the other side of what you do, where you do a lot of script adapting. 
and getting scripts ready and handling that. And then you also do a lot of voice directing. And this is a controversial show because either people love it or they hate it. And I personally loved it. But this show right here, because I love this show. I loved everything about it. I thought it was ultra sweet. I thought the concept was nice. I thought it was tied with a bow. And I loved this entire story, the first season at the very least. And I know you were heavily involved in that. So. What, what show? La Story del Arcana Familia. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. No, yeah. it, it was so tightly wrapped up and it was so meta. The entire show was so meta. And people give this show a lot of, you know, you know, grief and, and give it a lot of, you know, you know, a tough love and, and beat it up a lot. But I'm like, man, this was kind of nice. It was nicely wrapped up. It was meta. It was very circular. And I thoroughly enjoyed the first season where it was nicely tied up. And it was just like, this is a fun show to watch in a season. Well, I thank didn't... you for saying that. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, there's a one little hiccup with the whole show. And that's because uh, I insisted that the word was familia, not familia. And so uh, I, I, I screwed the pooch on that. But <laughs> it is a good show, but it's a fun show. But I, I, I messed that up. So let, let's move on to something else that I didn't mess up. But, but, but even to talk about that, because I think what people don't understand about voice acting is that there's more than just voice acting. There's a voice director who is obviously directing and steering the show and making sure that I need more from you on this character. I need less. Or you need to pull some Bruce Willis moonlighting out for me. Um, you know, <laughs> something along those lines, as well as, you know, if you have 40 episodes, you have to have a good idea where the show's going in the next 40 episodes or over the next, you know, even 10 episodes so that you can direct your characters and mm -hmm. your voice actors where they need to be. Good, good examples that if Nami in the Arlong arc, you need to tell whoever's voicing Nami that it's going to get emotional and that you should start preparing for that, you know, and that that fight. And you should probably give that actress a heads up. Versus yeah, I mean, you always you always give your actors a heads up if you can. Um, I will tell you this, that a lot of the actors that we work with um, as a director, uh, a lot of them, you know, you, you tell them what what's going on. And then uh, you go through the story and they just. You know, a lot of them like Lucy Christian and Brittany Karbowski and Monica Rial and uh, Eric Vale and Ian Sinclair and Bryson Bogus and. Uh, even Mike Kaimoto and, and just a, the list goes on and on, dude. Adam Gibbs, Scott Gibbs, um, even my daughter, Olivia Swayze. They're just, they are actors and they know how to handle the material and they know how to, they know how to act. And when you've got somebody who knows how to act, you really don't have to do a whole lot of directing. You let them do what they know how to do. You guide them. And you, you nudge them this way or that way to keep them on track. But for the most part, I mean, you just let them let them do their thing, you know, and that's that's my style of directing. I mean, you know, everyone has their own own methods, but um, I just I I just work. And, I, and the directors I've worked with at Funimation and uh, in Sentai and, you know, everywhere, I mean, you know, they they trust what we're doing, you know, and they bring us in because they know what we can do. You know, they're not, for instance, they're not going to bring me in to read for a 17 year old boy. Now it's just not going to happen. That's not in my wheelhouse. They're going to bring me in to be his father, his grandfather, you know, something like that, because that's where, that's where my voice sits. So, um, but yeah, it, it, you know, it's, you definitely, your, your prep work ahead of time. And, and, you know, a lot of actors, you know, they'll come in prepared. You know, they've, they've watched the episode in Japanese. They've, they've seen what they're doing. They, they, they have an idea of what's going on. And, you know, the more prep work like that you can do, the better off you are. So. Yeah. And the reason why I bring this up is that, you know, if you want to be in this space, you do not have to technically be a voice actor to be involved in voice acting. 
where script adapting is very big. I mean, it obviously helps if you're a voice actor and if you can do it, it's great. But even the idea that obviously to make a living in all of this, directing or assisting directing, script adapting, you know, there's more than just the actual character work. Oh, yeah, people, yeah. People, I think, forget that. I think people, they look at voice actors and like, I want to be a voice actor. And, you know, there's a lot more to it than just that. And it's a big thing. I mean, there's sound engineers and all that stuff is just as important. Man, let me tell you something. Every voice actor will tell you up front, uh, they are as only as good as the sound engineer because that's who really, really makes the magic. You know, they they can take two different takes and put them together, call it Frankenstein it, you know, they can make it sound great. You know, you're a little short, you're a little long. They can make it fit perfectly. Um, so, yeah, but there's writers, there's translators, there's QC people. There's marketing. I mean, there's a whole, you know, if you want to get involved in anime, there's a whole gazillion things you can do, not just being a voice actor. There, You can get involved in a number of ways. So, um, you know, the main thing is if it makes you happy, do it. Yeah, and, and I think that that's a perfect place to, to stop right there. But I do want to give you a chance to promote yourself. So obviously we spoke about a lot of stuff, but where could people bother you? Where could people hit you up? I know that you run an anime con and you're involved in that and you got a lot of stuff going on. So I do, Andrew. Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this year out of 52 weekends, I've done, I will have done 46 events. So it's been a very, very busy year. Um, uh, this weekend, uh, I'm going to be at Tokyo night festival here in Houston, Texas. Then I'll be up in Wisconsin, uh, the next weekend. Then Thanksgiving weekend, I have my own show I put on called Anime Dallas, which will be in Dallas, Texas. Um, we have a great guest list, so come on out for that. Uh, then I'll be in Florida. Then I'll be in Chicago. Then I'll be in Fort Worth. And then Christmas. So, <laughs> so and then we start all. Then we start again in January. We start it all over again. You know. So. So where can people find you? Hit you up because obviously. You're friend me on fa Facebook and Facebook and Instagram are the best two places. Um, I do a little bit of Twitter, but not much. But Instagram and Facebook are pretty much where you can find me, no problem. Uh, or go to Voices of John Swayze uh, on Facebook. That's a great. I'm trying to build that up, so please go visit that. And uh, uh, yeah, you know, stay in touch. I love to hear from people, and I'm a very you know, if you message me, I'll message you back. You know, I'm not a you can't talk to me kind of guy. I'm very accessible. So, well, all, all I'm going to say is that I know you eventually have a store coming. So obviously be on the lookout for that. Just throw that on your website. Um, and even going further into that, obviously, you know, if you're at a con, everybody, you know, the best way how to support voice actors is obviously watch the roles they're in. And when they have prints or they're signing stuff, obviously go to their booths at cons. It does make a difference go to panels that they're hosting, you know, clap, you know, thank yous, go a long way, following people on social media is a big deal. Um, and support anime legally is a big thing. Seriously, you know, you know, buy Crunchyroll, guys. Buy, buy Crunchyroll. It's 80 bucks a year. Just, get just, Crunchyroll, get, get Crunchyroll. You can also get uh, High Dive, which is Sentai. It's five bucks a month. Five dollars a month. So, so support anime legally. Trust me, I don't think you can lose high die or crunch roll but anyway also you know obviously social media and as far as i'm concerned i really appreciate everybody checking out all my social media it's pop anime comics on twitter instagram facebook i buy me a coffee if you so choose to want to do that i'm doing a bunch of cool stuff with some interesting things going on with some ad spots with people so if you're interested in that you could hit me up and uh, we could talk and uh it's not what you think. It's going to be super exciting. Um, so anybody can hit me up on that point. Um, and again, you know, obviously subscribe on YouTube. And on that note, I'm going to give you the final word before I let you get out of here. Hey, man. Andrew, thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure, dude. Appreciate it. And thank you for all you're doing to support the industry. Well, I don't think I could top that. So that is a wrap, everybody. <laughs>